This is Greg Troutwine with Maritime Reporter TV, and we're very pleased to be joined today by Philip Lewis, the Director of Research for World Energy Reports and the author of The Outlook for Offshore Wind Power, The Frontier of Future Energy. First and foremost, Phil, welcome to Maritime Reporter TV. Hi, Greg, and thanks for the welcome. Oh, absolutely. So, Phil, as you know better than I, activity around the offshore wind industry is moving rapidly, particularly in the East Coast U.S., to start us off, can you give us a brief on recent activities in the states of Virginia, New York, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island? Yes, Greg. Uh, this has certainly been an active year for offshore wind, both in the US and also globally. Uh, looking at the US in particular, the East Coast is certainly giving us cause for real optimism, with a clear pipeline of state procurement targets in indicating 12 gigawatts installed by 2030 and a total 29.1 gigawatts installed by 2035. Now that means around 55 to 87 billion dollars of capex, which will support the growth of a significant domestic supply chain. Virginia saw the first installation of offshore wind turbines in federal waters this year with CVAL, that's the Coastal Virginia Offshore Wind 12 megawatt pilot project. The pilot has completed reliability testing recently, uh, just in the last few weeks, and is ready to enter commercial service. The next step is to get a BOM uh, technical review of final documents. The turbines remain operational during the period. This is a really important step on Virginia's path to meet its 5.2 gigawatt of installed offshore wind target by 2034. Dominion, the developer, has uh, developed a very interesting relationship with the world's leading offshore wind player, Orsted, that helped it deliver the pilot's uh, project and will help it deliver the major developments in coming years. Now, the governors of Virginia, Maryland and North Carolina have just uh, announced tri-state collaboration to advance wind projects in the offshore wind supply chain in the southeast and mid-Atlantic. This could benefit projects like the 800 megawatt Kitty Hawk uh, project off North Carolina and Virginia. I'm glad uh, that you also mentioned Rhode Island. That's the home of America's first wind farm, the 30 megawatt uh, Block Island development in South in state waters, not federal waters, and a procurer of 400 megawatts of power from Orsted's planned Revolution Wind Project. The governor has uh, just announced a request for proposal for first half 2021 for a 600 megawatt wind farm as part of the state's plan to source 100% of its power. Um, as renewable from renewable sources by 2030. Very exciting move there. You've also mentioned New York, uh, the state with the largest uh, target for offshore wind install capacity in the US at nine gigawatts by 2035. Around 20% of the procurement target has been made to date by NYSERDA and LIPA for the Empire Wind, Sunrise and South Fork projects. But a number of developers have just submitted bids for NYSERDA's recent wind solicitation for up to 2,500 megawatts of offshore wind, uh, which will be awarded, uh, the target is in the fourth quarter, so November, December, December time. Now these uh, uh, submissions include Equinor with two bids, and we should say probably by the end of the first quarter of next year, we should see BP as a 50% partner in the project, Equinor 50%, BP 50%, a big move by an oil and gas company. The projects on the Equinor bid are Empire Wind Phase 2, which is around 800 megawatts, and Beacon Wind uh, for 1,230 megawatts. And these will both use the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal for construction and the ONM base. Great opportunities there. Orsted and Eversource have submitted multiple options for the Sunrise 2 offshore wind farm. And they have Con Edison as a partner for uh, the distribution, a very important part of the success of the wind farm. Iberdrola has submitted through its US subsidiary Avengrid uh, with the vineyard joint venture with CIP with the up to 1,300 megawatt Liberty wind project. And finally, all eyes uh, remain on the Boehm environmental and technical review and of approval process for the Vineyard 800 megawatt wind farm off Massachusetts. And this is very important in the context of future Atlantic offshore wind, technical resource potential development and state capacity targets. Vineyard is the litmus case uh, test. The review also covers a range of developments, including up to 14 megawatt turbines and the building of 50% monophiles and 50% jackets 
the latter which could undoubtedly raise US supply chain opportunities. A decision is expected to be made in late December by Boeing of this year and could be the trigger to accelerate the approval of a further 10 wind farms for 7.4 gigawatts that are already at the similar stage to Vineyard at the, that's called the COP stage of the Boehm process. When we look at the offshore wind market, obviously it's not simply about the offshore wind, but we look at it as a buoy for the offshore energy, uh, the maritime, the port and the logistics sectors. Obviously, much of the discussion has been made, particularly here in the United States, about the availability of vessels, particularly the very large high value wind farm installation vessels. What do you see happening in that niche market? Well, Greg, you touch on a particularly interesting area that we're looking into at World Energy Report. At a macro level, there are a couple of key trends uh, driving the supply and demand balance for the wind turbine installation vessels, or WTIV, as they're known for short. And these are the ever-increasing size of wind turbines uh, and offshore wind farms being built further offshore in deeper waters. Obviously, the initial wind farms are built closer to shore and as time goes on further offshore. So the age of today's wind turbine installation vessels is around 13 years. It doesn't sound too old, but if we look back at to 2010, the largest turbines were around three megawatts. Now they had a rotor diameter of 90 meters. By 2016, we'd already reached eight megawatt turbines with rotor diameters of 165 meters, significantly larger. The latest uh, generation of turbines have rotor di uh, diameters in excess of 220 meters. Larger turbines, we larger monopiles or jackets on which to sit the um, turbines and larger installation capabilities. Deeper water means longer legs to be jacked up. Yes, some of the fleet has been modified and upgrade, um, upgraded, but new tonnage is being committed all of the time to keep up with both the latest technical demands and the increasing demand overall for installation capacity as offshore wind keeps on growing. Now, several markets want to maximize the amount of local content, and as a result, new builds have been specifically targeted for the Taiwanese and developing Japanese markets. We're also now seeing talk of US Jones Act compliant, uh, compliant with turbine installation vessels, with Dominion leading a consortium to locally bid a vessel with a 2,200 uh, ton crane capable of lifting today's largest planned turbines. That's the 220 meter rotor diameter Siemens Gamasa 14 megawatt direct drive turbine for their 5.2 gigawatt pipeline of projects in Virginia. Norway's OIM has also raised the possibility of building a 2,600 ton crane wind turbine installation vessel, 67 meter maximum water depth, capable of working 365 all through the year and capable of installing the largest turbines and double XL monopiles. Moves like this will reduce the dependence on overseas tonnage for US projects as was seen on the Dominion pilot, where the foreign flag Volavon wind turbine installation vessel completed a mainly Jones Act installation spread, and on Block Island, where the Brave Turn wind turbine installation vessel undertook the major installation elements, again supported by a, a Jones Act uh, domestic spread. Uh, given the pipeline of US projects, we believe that we'll see a combination of Jones Act compliant and foreign flag wind turbine installation vessels coupled with locally flagged feeder and support vessels. Phil, obviously it's still in its infancy, but much talk now is turning to the prospect for floating offshore wind. Yeah. When you look at floating wind, where are the major areas of activity that you see today? <clears throat> well, that's a good question, Greg. Uh, World Energy reports, we see floating offshore wind rapidly moving from the current status of demonstrators and pre-commercial projects to full-scale commercial wind farms in the North Sea, the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, and East Asia. There is a substantial developing pipeline of projects in these markets. In fact, we are monitoring over 60 gigawatts of floating projects at various stages of, development, of the development pipeline, and this just keeps growing. As projects become larger, the technology is becoming increasingly cost competitive and is offering the supply chain some significant opportunities. 
The question of how to industrialize the supply chain to deal with multiple concurrent 500 megawatt wind farms is worrying many developers and contractors. But as with every challenge, we see opportunities for fabricators, concrete contractors, shipyards and offshore yards, ports, mooring chain providers, synthetic rope manufacturers, anchor suppliers, and of course, OSV owner operators. Finally, I'd like to touch on floating wind in the US. Many of those that I talk to about US wind are surprised about the potential for floating wind in the country. The North and South Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico offer the largest technically feasible potential for floating wind in the country, but you cannot discount the role that floating wind can play in the energy transition of California and Hawaii. In addition to providing power to electricity grids, we see floating offshore wind, along with bottom fixed uh, offshore wind farms, providing power for the decarbonisation of existing oil and gas operations, very suitable for the Gulf of Mexico, as is, see, as is being planned currently at Equinor's floating high wind tumpen project, and also for powering ele electrolyzers to turn water into oxygen and more importantly, hydrogen, a key element of the ongoing global energy transition, something that we are monitoring with keen interest at World Energy Reports. Okay. Phil, as always, we appreciate your time and your insights. Oh, thanks very much, Craig. Much appreciated.